Well, the Foreign Secretary says imports of Russian oil and coal will be banned by the end of the year. The Prime Minister says the deaths of civilians in Bucha are not far short of genocide. International correspondent for The Independent, Belle True, is in the city and has told LBC what she's witnessed. There was a family who'd actually stayed put hiding in their cellar. One of the, the, te- the teenage boy told me that he was nearly summarily executed by Russian soldiers and his life was saved by a commander at the very last second. A security guard accused of spying for Russia at the British Embassy in Berlin has been extradited to the UK. 57-year-old David Ballantyne Smith will appear in court tomorrow. A recall of Kinder Eggs has been extended over concerns about a salmonella outbreak. The Food Standards Agency says there have been 63 cases in the UK, mostly young children. The chocolate manufacturer Ferrero says none of its other products are affected. And Ed Sheeran has won a High Court copyright case over his 2017 single Shape of You. A judge has has ruled he didn't copy another song by Sammy Switch. In the city, the FTSE 100 closed down 26 points at 75.87. The pound buys $1.30 and €1.19. LBC weather, rain moving into southern England tonight with scattered showers elsewhere. Showery rain turning to snow in the far north, a low of one degree. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Lottie Morley. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation, Cross Question, with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. It's Wednesday's edition of Cross Question. It's one minute past eight. On the panel with me are Naomi Smith, Chief Executive of Best for Britain, Angus Walker, former Special Advisor at the Department of Education and former ITV political correspondent, as well as a number of international appointments. We'll come on to those maybe a little bit later. Professor Vernon Bogdanoy is Professor of Government at King's College London and Hashi Mohammed, a veteran of the programme, is barrister, broadcaster and author of the book People Like Us, What It Takes to Make it in modern Britain. The number to call if you'd like to put a question to our panel 0345 6060 973 and remember you can watch us on Global Player. Call 0345 6060 973 Tweet at LBC Text 84850 Cross Question with Ian Dale This is LBC Well, welcome to you all. Let's go to our first question. It's from Neil in Exeter. Hi, Neil. Hi. Uh, My question is, should should the uh, national insurance hike be uh, uh, addressed to the people that were in receipt of the 80% furlough money rather than a blanket across the populace, including the key workers that kept the country going, nurses and firemen on minimum wage? Why Why would you just restrict it to people on furlough? Well, they, they my opinion, I'm a commercial pilot and, and I got myself up to Tesco's because the airport was closed on my, I was unable to get furlough money, uh, working for minimum wage and a lot of pilots were at Tesco's. But you've got nurses and firemen work throughout the pandemic and the pandemic, as we know it today, is different to what we knew March lockdown. We didn't know what was ahead of us. So, the the you know, I've got neighbours that were working, and they got 80% of their furlough money. It was just one long holiday. And uh, so, everybody now seems to be paying back, through the national insurance, the joy of having that 80% of your okay. money sat at home. I mean, it's, it's interesting. In the last hour, we had a caller say something similar, saying that people who had money on furlough should have had to repay it over a long period of time, which caused a bit of angst among one or two other of our callers. Um, Naomi Smith, let's start with you. Well, hi, Neil. And uh, at Best of Britain, we um, were secretary up to the biggest all-party parliamentary group in parliamentary history, which was the APPG for gaps in support, because so many people fell through uh, the cracks and weren't... Uh, entitled to furlough. They were ineligible for it either because they were self-employed and newly self-employed or perhaps they were newly joined on uh, a contract and hadn't been there long enough, etc. Um, and there were you know, m- m- many millions, so three million people that were denied furlough and then put into the situation that you were in, either having to find key worker job else- elsewhere or or you know, eating savings and, and, and not have that opportunity. So I think that is an important point to make. The, the government did a lot of good stuff with furlough, but it didn't cover everyone that was meant to. I think on the national insurance hikes, the the key thing that 
I think is worth mentioning is that this is a tax on earned income. Uh, and there hasn't been uh, enough on those that have the broader shoulders. There hasn't been uh, any extra cost for landlords, for shareholders, for those with the broader shoulders. No uh, windfall tax on uh, energy companies that are making uh, massive profits at the moment. So it's a pretty regressive move, uh, in my opinion. But it um, is being counted for the lower paid in July, isn't it? Yes, uh, it is. Um, but uh, it is still taxing <laughs> hard work uh, and incomes rather than the idleness of unearned wealth um, and you know we have we've seen tax breaks for bankers alongside it so um, I think there are other things that the government could have done and should have done and the <coughs> levers that they were pulled however I think on the point of you know is this to you know, compensate for the amounts that were spent on furlough. I, as I understand it, the government is saying that this is about funding social care, um, which of course is is critically underfunded and does need to be sorted out in the UK. But I would argue that there were other levers they should have pulled, not least ones around trade, which I'm sure we'll get to at some point. Well, you never know. Angus Walker. Yeah, I'm picking up on what Naomi said, actually, Neil. I, I'm not sure I see the connection between furlough money and this um, national insurance hike myself because I think it was set out quite clearly to be money that would be raised for the health service and social care and actually it is an issue all governments have tried to wrestle with of how we uh, pay for looking after people uh, in old age properly and actually the answer uh, you know it, it's a tough one but it does mean that we are going to have to you know raise that money and um, it's going to come out of uh, the money we earn. And as, as long as this money is used properly, and I, 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 I'm, you know, I think there's a debate about whether this is going to be enough money, because I think the problem is probably bigger. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you hear from local authorities, you hear from the care sector as well, they are uh, always calling for better funding. Whether this money being raised is enough, um, I'm not so sure, but it is meant to be ring-fenced for that. So um, if it's for that, then I think that uh, we must see it as a, as a standalone <coughs> tax, if you like, that's going towards something that needs to be tackled. OK. Hashi Mohammed. Well, I do think that the national insurance hike is, um, as Naomi said, a regressive taxation that ends up hitting a lot of people, even if you do take uh, allowances for the fact that those much lower paid uh, will be given some sort of a break. But I think there are probably three fundamental problems with how we then address this. Now, to, to Neil's point, I think it would be slightly unfair on those people who benefited from furlough legitimately at an unprecedented time of difficulty for this country to then be specifically targeted as if it was some sort of a punishment. And I think that's the message that Neil's proposal would be sending out in a way that's, that I don't think it's helpful. And I don't think that's a way to be... Well, if on, if on day one the Chancellor had said, exactly. well, you will have to pay this back at exactly. some point, I think you could understand that maybe. Uh, but there was never any suggestion of that. Absolutely. And I think that is a, that's the critical part of why I think Neil's uh, way of looking at it might be difficult. But in terms of broadening this out and this suggestion that the money is then being raised in a way to try and deal with the social care crisis, that for me is an even bigger problem because the social care crisis is one of the main issues of our time if we don't take account of, for example, so, you know, uh, uh, climate change or the housing crisis that we face. Social care is one of those big, big juggernauts of an issue. And I think that raising the national uh, insurance hike in this way to try and deal with that is tinkering around the edges. And frankly, it's another example of politicians failing to face up to a how, real crisis. How is it tinkering around the edges when um, that amount of money, I think, is it six billion that it's raised? I mean, that is a hell of a lot of money. But, but uh, Ian, that six billion mon uh, um, pounds, that's a lot of money, but you and I will have another conversation on cross questions. one and a half P on income tax. You and I will have this another conversation in about two years' time, and you'll be saying, here's another proposal by the government to raise more money for social care. It is unsustainable, it's tinkering around the edges, and you need to have a much more long-lasting answer to the social care problem at a time when we have an ageing population, pressure on the NHS, and people essentially using the NHS now as a crutch for, social, for, for, for taking care of our old. It's not sustainable. That's why I think the hike may help us in the short term. It may raise a significant amount of money, but it isn't really got to a place where we need it to, to address this bigger okay. picture. Further Bogdan. Well, I'm with Naomi and Hashim on this. Uh, no doubt the furlough scheme wasn't sensitive enough. Very difficult to make a scheme 
extremely sensitive in the short time one had to decide these matters. We faced a serious emergency. But it, it seems to me that the national insurance tax is absolutely the wrong tax to raise in the first place. Because it is a tax, it's, isn't it? It's not insurance. It's yeah. And it's a tax on earnings, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, and until, I think it's going to be changed, but until now, it's not been paid by pensioners and it's not been paid on dividends. It's still not paid on shares and property. That is, it's paid by active people, but not by people whose income is increasing simply by passively owning shares and property. So it, it's a regressive tax. It's, it's, it's a grave error. And on the question of the levy for health and social care, I'm afraid I'm with the principle that Tony Blair laid down. You shouldn't give extra money to public services unless you can be sure they are going to reform themselves. We've poured huge amounts of money into the health service. Just a few weeks ago, we had the report on the Shropshire crisis. We've had other crises. The way the health service operates now is simply not fit for purpose. And I'm not convinced that simply throwing more money at it without reform is going to do very much good. But the, the trouble is, any attempt at reforming the NHS is bound to be hugely politically controversial. And as the old phrase, to govern is to choose, but you, you start tinkering, well, not just tinkering, but you, you want to carry out meaningful reforms to the NHS, and you have so many vested interests, whether it's a Labour government or a Conservative government, you've got so many vested interests arguing for the status quo. Absolutely right, but politicians aren't elected just to avoid controversial decisions. They're there to lead. And if we look at the prime ministers who made an impact, Margaret Thatcher, Tony Blair, Claire Attlee, they all led. They didn't wait to see what the opinion polls said. They said, this is what we think is right. We must go ahead on that basis. And in, in my opinion, the health service needs a royal commission to report within a year people working full-time to look at other systems, not, I hasten to say, the American system, but continental systems, to see whether we haven't anything to learn from them. Because our survival rates, for example, for many cancers, are much less good mm -hmm. than for other systems mm -hmm. where they actually spend less money than we do. So we're not really getting good value for the money we spend. And it's for all governments to take strategic decisions. That's what they're elected for. And I rather hope this government will and should do so. Um, Angus, you, you've worked within government. You've also worked in the media I mean, at a time when a lot of these arguments were happening. I can remember Anne Widdicombe in about 2000 when she was Shadow Health Secretary doing a, an hour-long programme with Jonathan Dimbleby where she said, well, the, the trouble is that um, it's politicians find it impossible to reform the health service because there's never a meaningful debate about it because as soon as someone suggests reform, they're shouted down saying, oh, you want to privatise it. Yeah, yeah, and I think there is this uh, age-old argument uh, in British um, politics, which is, and in public life really, that we do sort of we, we do sort of want Scandinavian welfare on U.S. taxes, and the burden uh, of uh, old age is only going to get greater. You know, we have an aging population; we can't get away from that. So I actually think that Vernon's got a good idea there. That perhaps we're getting to a point. Perhaps this rise in national insurance is actually telling us that we're getting to a point where we might need a, a, quite a big rethink of the whole system because when it was created, we didn't have this ageing population. We didn't have people living so long. We are having that now. We all look forward to a long uh, life uh, and a long retirement, etc. But we will need care at the end of our lives. Uh, that cost to society is only going to get bigger. Um, politicians very, very wary of raising taxes, but um, perhaps well, we need to I, I have mean, a, a very tricky conversation. I, I, and, and I think that's the point that why are they having to raise taxes? Because we have had a decade plus of lost economic growth. We've got falling real terms wages and we're no good at trade anymore. Our trade intensity is declining. So as a proportion of GDP, our, our share of trade has fallen 12% uh, compared with 2019, which is two and a half times more than any other G7 country. So uh, it, it's the economic mismanagement, it's the, frankly the pandemic mismanagement that has put us into a situation where the government now is having to raise money and they're choosing to do it through taxing earned rather than unearned income. So whatever solution we, we need to get to on health and social care, uh, as, as you've both said, you know, we've got an ageing population, but we also have... Uh, 
pulled up the drawbridge on immigrants as well. And you can't you can't do both. You can't uh, say, well, we won't have, we have uh, people we coming to, to help us with why, social care. Why do you care. say that? We haven't, we well, haven't done well, that because, at all. Because you, we're making you, it much, much, much more difficult. If, if, we, we don't have freedom of movement anymore. We, we, we have net immigration into this country. We have far fewer people wanting to come here. We've created Not an true. environment that, 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 that people are, are no longer wanting to come to. Also, when you uh, have a, a, so, a weakened this economy... Is, this is a complete fallacy. We have more EU citizens living in this country than we did in 2016. And we need even more. We need. Well, that may be we so. Need, we need, but you we can't need, say that we've closed our borders when well, that is simply not the case. We, well, we have left the EU, and yeah. with that, we have lost freedom of movement yeah. in both directions. But immigration and, from the EU. Well, okay, has but been we have shortage occupations. We have huge shortage occupations and across we did lots of industries. We were, when we were particularly, in the EU. and it's getting acute now, particularly within social care particularly within social care. That sector will tell you that they are struggling to recruit. We have not invested in the skills in this country and that takes time, even if the government is to do that now. You're looking at years of training people and, 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 and all of that. At the same time as you're making it much more unattractive to come here if you are a qualified uh, you know, social care professional from another country. How are you making it less attractive to come because here. we have a hostile environment because oh we make it very goodness. very You're difficult out with all the old tropes tonight aren't you i mean we have not close what part of we have in we have a net flow inward flow of immigration every single year to the tune of three four five hundred thousand per year um, that is very little different from when we were in the eu but but what we've done is we've made it more difficult now for people to apply uh, to do some of the jobs that need doing, and we don't have those people trained no, in the UK that done, are able to. Surely, what we've done is create a level playing field. So, if you come from Indonesia or if you come from the West Indies, you have a level playing field but, but, with but, people we, from but, the but, EU. But, but that was nothing to do with being in the EU. It was all, we, we could have always made it as easy for those. Uh, migrants to come here. That wasn't a constraint of being a, a member of the EU. No, of course, of course it that. wasn't, but but those people are still so it, coming the, here, and, and, and in some sectors, in increased numbers. But not in the sectors that we're talking about right now that are critically underfunded, and we're talking about how to uh, sort that problem out. You know, we, we have got a, a health and social care crisis in the UK, and we have shortage occupations across multiple uh, positions within those sectors. Um, Hashi, do you, do you accept what? Well, Naomi's I mean, I, I don't. I I don't think it's controversial, um, Ian, for Naomi to say that since two thousand and sixteen, whilst uh, we have left the European Union and there are plenty of European citizens who are still coming and many who have left, it isn't controversial to say that there are some sectors, low-paid jobs, uh, the kind of sectors in the in the health and social care, the NHS, the kind of jobs that, frankly, British people were not doing is suffering. And that has to be linked to some extent with that European market of people who are coming to do those jobs. Now, I agree with you that in the end, you know, it's not as easy as simply to say, because we've left the European Union, nobody wants to come here anymore. I think that would be too simplistic to say that. But if you are living in the European Union and you do want to come today, it is in immensely much harder to do that and it, than it was before 2016. So I don't think it's a controversial. Well, and that was inevitable. That, but that doesn't yes, mean to say that but, people but, aren't still coming. But, but by the way, I don't buy this argument that now we've levelled the playing field for people in the West Indies or elsewhere. That's just simply not true either. Because whilst ostensibly we have, on the face of it, in theory, said, if you are from the European Union or you're from the West Indies, you can come here. Let's be honest. It's fundamentally much more difficult for you to get a visa, a work visa, if you're coming from the from from the West Indies than if you were coming from the European Union or somewhere closer. So, in theory, we may have uh, leveled the playing field. In practice, there is a massive shortage of labour on those jobs that people in this country did not want to do before and may want to do in the future, but our sectors, in particular the health and social care sector, is suffering as a result. Th there are sectors of suffering, you're both absolutely right. My point was though, I mean, if you look at the NHS, I think um, before we left the EU, the numbers of people from outside this country working in the NHS was about 22%, and I think it's still around 22%. But it, you're right, in social care, that is certainly a sector that uh, needs a lot more people to work in it, whether they're from this country or not. Right, we will come to more of your questions in a moment. Thank you very much, Neil, for that. It's 19 minutes past state. This is LBC.
Ask Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 21 minutes past eight, we have Naomi Smith from Best for Britain, Angus Walker, who is... Now, what are you doing now, Angus? Tell us I, what I you, you, you've gone... I PR firm. You've gone to Denford the dark Associates. side, haven't you? Yeah, I, I work for <laughs> Denford Associates, a lovely PR firm. There we go, plug. <laughs> well, well done. Um, Hashi Mohammed is here. Now, um, we've, I've interviewed you a couple of times about your book, People Like Us. Are you writing another one? Yes, uh, I've got a second book coming out in September about the housing crisis called A Home of One's Own. Well, there yeah. you go. That is a crisis. Yeah. Vernon, you have a new book coming out, don't well, you? Well, I think... Hashi will put us academics out of work if he keeps writing at this pace. Yes, I've got a book coming out which is published by your estimable firm Ex -estimable called The firm. Strange Survival of Liberal Britain. It's about British politics before 1914. It was all very calm then, wasn't it? I think. Well, we'll find out when reading your book. <laughs> right, let's go to another call. It's Mark in Wood Green. Hello, Mark. Hi, Ian. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. What would you like to ask? Uh, yes, do the panel think that um, the war in Ukraine is being treated any differently by the West and both general public and the government? Uh, because, frankly, it's a, uh, a mostly white state in a European on the European continent. I think this is a debate which is increasing, actually. Um, Angus Walker. Yeah, well, I've, I've been working with uh, a, 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 an, a, an organisation called More in Common, and along with um, uh, British Future, they launched the Homes for Afghans campaign last week, arguing that, you know, the, the Homes for Ukraine scheme had been launched. Why not expand that and, and help find proper housing for those Afghan refugees uh, who are still stuck in hotels, about 12,000? Well, I asked Richard Harrington this on the programme last night, mm. and he said, well, they've already been uprooted once. Surely you don't want to uproot them again. I said, well, I think most people would rather live in a home rather than a hotel room. Yeah, I think, I think our experience of lockdown tells us that the idea of being, uh, you know, in a in one room in a hotel with your family mm. uh, for seven months since the fall of Kabul is not a particularly appealing um, prospect. So, you know, th that campaign's been launched. It's got cross-party support, about 50 signatures. Letters gone into Michael Gove. But I think that was uh, an example of people saying, why are we uh, just doing homes for Ukrainians when we could be helping so many other refugees and also posing the the question that maybe we have an opportunity to restructure community sponsorship refugee schemes which will uh, you know be on the shelf for the future if you like where you help people settle uh, and we can look after people who are escaping conflict and help them settle properly and integrate in society get jobs get their kids into school and and what's the reaction been to homes for afghans so far has has there been lots of people wanting to take it up as we've seen with the ukraine yeah um, absolutely and uh, if you look at some of the polling uh, that's been out there's been enormous uh, public support for helping refugees if you ask people about refugees you get pretty an yeah. even split if you ask people about if you add in community sponsorship, saying that businesses and organisations will help people find homes, find jobs, find schools, there's about a 12-point uh, rise in support for that type of refugee scheme. But, so, but does that kind of scheme work? Because the, the, the Syrian scheme, I had to call a, a few weeks ago saying, look, we, I live in a village, we got together a community scheme. And after, I don't know how long she said it was, 18 months, two years, they've only managed to house one family. Mm. And and you think well that's that's not what we need here. Here there needs to be a, a, a scheme that is very responsive, that is unbureaucratic. Um, but I, I mean every 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 scheme I suppose is different. Um, Vernon, do you think there is a a white brown split here? In one way, the split is less favourable to the whites. One of the last occasions on which one state invaded another was Iraq when she invaded Kuwait in 1990. And then we didn't restrict ourselves to economic sanctions. We actually invaded to get the Iraqis out of Kuwait. Now, we're not doing that with Ukraine, rightly, I fear, because it's simply too dangerous to oppose a great power such as Russia. But on the question of asylum and who, who comes in and so on, um, I think the, pro the problems are, are these, that... There's a great fear, and it's an exaggerated fear, that amidst the large number of Afghans who may come in, they could be a terrorist. And that's happened in Germany, apparently, from the Syrian refugees. And it needs just one terrorist to get into the country when the Home Secretary has to resign. So it's understandable that there are great fears. They're much exaggerated, 
and the policy is very, very heavy-handed. And that, I fear, is due to the Home Office, which a Labour Home Secretary, John Reid, said many years ago, the Home Office is not fit for purpose. And I'm afraid that is still true. Now, Priti Patel, who's responsible for policy, has been accused of bullying people in the Home Office. Perhaps you should bully them a bit more. She hasn't just been accused, she was found to have... Right. Well, it, it, the Home Office is very, very inefficient. Now, if things go wrong with Home Office policy, whether in the area of immigration or, or whatever, the Home Secretary takes the can. But a Home Secretary can easily be brought down by mistakes at a very low level of policy. Oh, look at Amber Rudd. Amber Rudd, exactly. But, but not taken um, down from being Now, we, we need, we need an, an inquiry, so I keep, keep seem to be suggesting inquiries. We need an inquiry into the Home Office. It's gone on too long. It is simply not very effective. And I think rather than prejudice, the, the main reason for things going wrong is simple incompetence. And actually, I think when things go wrong in government, incompetence is often actually a much better explanation than malice. Well, it's it's or more cock up than conspiracy, exactly. often, isn't it? Hashi? Well, I think uh, the reason Vernon's suggesting so many inquiries is because he, he knows it will involve <laughs> barristers and he wants me to stop writing. <laughs> um, uh, but I think I just want to pick up the point about the exaggerated fear. I, I think there is definitely an element, not just in this country, but in Europe, that if you take in refugees, Syrian refugees, particularly men, and particularly young men, <sighs> that there is that risk that the country uh, will be exposed to such a thing, which I do strongly uh, believe that it is an exaggerated fear and it can be controlled and it must be in a way controlled better but to deal with the question specifically as asked by Mark in relation to whether the British public and the West are treating this differently absolutely they are they're treating it differently because of the fact that this is a white Christian community it's on our doorstep it's in Europe uh, it's geographically close there is the threat of a nuclear war not far away from us. The way that the, all the stories have been framed in the press have humanized these people as people who need us, people who we should be taking in. And all of this way in which we consume the media and the suffering that's going on out there, definitely, and you don't need to take it from me, just look at the way we now see the Russians. And we see how the story about the Russians are being portrayed in some respects. And I'm sure that there is going to be some sort of a black backlash in that respect. But the final thing I'd say also is that we're not doing enough as a country. We've never done enough as a country. People always point out that we had the kinder transportation. Well, actually, as Jonathan Friedland's pointed out, the, the reason why we had the kinder transportation is because Britain was so hostile to the Jews that they were happy to take kids. And so that was the compromise, that take the children, but you don't have to take uh, uh, the, the, the men and, and others who, who might be coming. So we're not doing enough. We've never done enough. And the last thing I'd say, it's quite ironic that the Home Secretary today, who's so hostile in this respect, is the daughter of refugees, somebody who's a, who, who will have heard stories and who have been told stories of suffering. And there she is, acting tough and not doing enough. I have very little to add on top of what Hashish just said, with which I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, I think the war crimes that we've seen being committed in Butcher and other areas uh, that, that have been reported in the last 48 hours coming out of Russia are utterly horrific. And these scenes only increase the shame on our government uh, for the treatment of Ukrainian refugees. We are the only European country that hasn't just waived visas. They have put the responsibility onto the good people of the British public who have been incredibly generous uh, in, in responding to uh, open up their homes. Um, but the process isn't working. It is not fit for purpose. The government clearly underestimated the high levels of support amongst the British public to home uh, Ukrainian refugees. Uh, just 2,700 out of 28,000 applications have been successful so far. That's less than 10%. Uh, and so, you know, I, I agree with you entirely on the point that uh, while sentiment towards immigration it, it, at the macro level had been falling, uh, I think, since about uh, the end of the 90s, it was very consistent when you then asked the question about people seeking sanctuary, those fleeing war and violence, and, and the British public were always very open and supportive to that.
Yeah, I mean, if I, uh, I mean, I think uh, having been a, an advisor to the government, I think inside those rooms in the Home Office, I think we must have some sympathy for the fact that ministers who will be just as sympathetic as any other member of the public towards the plight of refugees uh, from this conflict will also be getting advice from the security services, who will also be conscious of what happened in Salisbury, who will also be conscious of the fact that Russia will have sinister thoughts uh, and aims and perhaps try to infiltrate into Britain to and and you know whether that is uh, exaggerated or not whether you think it's but a the true people from Salisbury came on a plane and they weren't 18 months old that's very that, very that's, true that's, that's, that's very true but but ministers might be if they're told that and then it's another no, story if they ignore I, it. I, I get that but yeah. when you have a 51 page form which, I mean, Richard yeah. Harrington last night told us that he and the Home Secretary sat down on a Sunday mm -hmm. evening yep. and tried to fill it in themselves. Yeah. And that was a pretty morose and, experience. And, and that's if you've got fast fibre optic yeah. broadband, a decent bit of kit. If you are cold, your fingers aren't working properly, you've maybe got a cracked screen mobile phone, if you're lucky, with some patchy 3G. What hope have you got of filling that in? Um, and, I mean, there's a question, have you ever been a war criminal? I mean, what on earth is the point of a question like that? Vernon, just very quickly. Well, um, going on to Hashi's point about uh, Jewish immigrants in the 1930s, we could obviously have done a lot more, but we were actually much more generous to Jewish immigrants than almost any other democracy, many of which had much greater space than we did, Australia, Canada, America, for example. If we look at today, I think the public are clearly much more generous than the government. But I'm very careful of attributing any racial motives to the government. I mean, if one looks at the current government, you've got, I think, six members of non-white ethnic minorities in it. If you look at Germany, which is often held up as a beacon of liberalism, if you look at Angela Merkel's last government in 2017, it had not a single French, member of an ethnic minority mm. in it. So and, I, and two of the top three great offices of state. Exactly. Held by people... Mayor of London. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, well, on that note of unanimity, uh, we will go to uh, get the news headlines from Lottie Morley. It's 8.33. The UK, EU and US have announced further sanctions on Russia after atrocities were committed in Ukraine. All new outward investment has been banned in the UK, while ministers say they will end and imports of Russian coal and oil by the end of the year. A security guard at the British Embassy in Berlin has been extradited to the UK, accused of spying for Russia. 57-year-old David Ballantyne Smith will appear in court tomorrow after being flown over from Germany. And more Kinder chocolate products have been recalled because of concerns over a salmonella outbreak. 63 cases have been recorded, mostly in young children. LBC weather, rain moving into southern England tonight with scattered showers elsewhere. Showery rain turning to snow in the far north, a low of one degree. This is LBC.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. It's 8.37. We have Naomi Smith, Angus Walker, Vernon Bogdanor and Hashi Mohammed with us answering your questions. Um, Essex Views is none too pleased with you. Uh, he says, once again, your show is one-sided anti-government propaganda. <laughs> no, it's called a debate, actually. It's never mentioned that the UK is giving massive amounts of money to military and military aid to Ukraine. We're, we're the most densely populated country in the EU. Not quite true. But we are a disgrace, according to your biased panel. Well, the reason we haven't been talking about military aid is because that wasn't the question. We, we have talked about that many times on the programme, and you're right, behind the United States, we are the leading provider of military aid to Ukraine, and quite right too. Uh, let's go to a text from Dom in Eltham. Uh, Given the news that NHS leaders are tonight asking families to accept loved ones home from hospital, even if they have COVID-19, in order to free up beds in hospitals with rocketing COVID rates and staff sickness, is the UK's plan to live with COVID working. Hashi? Well, I think it's too early to tell, but I think the public government policy and the general attitude to, 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 um, to COVID has really moved on, sadly, because we're now at a point where you don't have to necessarily self-isolate if you're positive. You'd be lucky if you can get a hold of any tests from your local pharmacy. So I do think that, that, that we are moving on to a world where we just have to understand that we, we will live with it. And, and, and Wasn't that always inevitable, though? That was always inevitable. I mean, I've been to places like Sweden where they never closed down and they never had a lockdown or anything, and they always made that big decision. Absolutely, it was inevitable. Let's just hope that the most vulnerable have been vaccinated are protected and that some of us still are quite sensible if we are positive and that we stay away that's the best we can do but we won't know if we're positive well if you've got a test i mean yeah and yeah, got... yeah i mean i think uh my my response would be no um i don't think it is working because we've seen this week uh more than one company say that they've had to well airlines um have to had to restrict flights due to the numbers of staff who are off ill. We've got incredibly high rates uh, in the country at the moment, I think, in some parts of the country, the highest they've been. And then there's this lesser talked about issue of long COVID. Um, and this is affecting over 1.5 million people in the UK alone. Uh, it is having a massively debilitating impact on their lives, but of course also on their economic activity, many of them unable to work at the rate that they were or even at all. Um, and uh, we did an FOI request and the, the NHS lost something like 4 million uh, uh, hours to um, long COVID last year. So, you know, at, at a time when we need our health professionals firing on all cylinders, uh, lots of them are struggling with this. And so the more you allow the uh, virus to, you know, run run freely through the population, the more people are going to get long COVID. Uh, and we need to have far more research uh, into long-term effective treatments for them and um, monetary support for them if they're unable to work in the interim. I mean, there are things that the government could have done. They they needn't have withdrawn uh, free COVID testing, but I think, that, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that was costing 2.2 billion a month. I mean, that, that's massive, what Johnson said. But actually, when when uh, when we put a parliamentary question down about it to ask uh, the minister if an assessment had been made on the saving from it, they said no assessment had been made. But then Johnson had said it separately. So uh, whether that was an internal briefing he'd had that that they're not making public, I don't know. So yes, it is incredibly expensive, um, but. To know the cost of everything and the value of nothing doesn't make for good leadership. I suppose, um, then, if, if we look at the role of government here, the, the last thing the government wants to do is to keep a country in lockdown any longer than is absolutely necessary. But there are sort of... I mean, there, there's a medium way, isn't there, between naught and 100, with lockdown being 100 and total freedom being naught. Do you think they've got the balance right? Not quite. It's a difficult judgment to make, as you imply, between... Um, keeping lockdown or restrictions and the needs of the economy. And my own view is that the government has relaxed things rather too early. I understand why they've done it. And I'm sorry that we're all regarded as really hostile critics to the government of the government. I think constructive and friendly like advice... One constructive and friendly advice is, is perhaps <coughs> a better way of putting it, which surely any government should welcome. And um, I think they have relaxed too early. And there are these dangers, particularly from people who haven't been vaccinated. And uh, I hold, uh, say something perhaps very controversial, I hold the view that vaccination should have been made absolutely compulsory. We made smallpox vaccination compulsory in 1853. And while you may have a right to injure yourself, 
you haven't a right to infect and injure other people. So I, I'm generally, although I'm I feel not, as if we've just gone back in time about 18 well, months. With, uh, well, I, the, our, our discussions were dominated by that argument. Although, then. although I'm normally on the libertarian <laughs> side, I think on this they have relaxed the restrictions slightly too early. Many people are still getting ill. There's still a large number of deaths. I suspect some of them may have been avoidable. As I say, it's a difficult decision to make, and one can understand why the government has made that decision. I don't think they're quite right. Angus? Well, I think uh, if you go back two years, then uh, really we need to bear in mind that the NHS is still, you know, not an infinite um, resource. You know, there are a certain number of beds uh, and uh, intensive care beds in the country. And if we get to a point where the NHS is overwhelmed, then that is serious implications for the entire country. I mean, that is a really important point, I think, in that if you look at the decline in the number of beds, whether it's intensive care or general ward beds, since 1980, I mean, it is absolutely mm. horrific un under governments of all colours. Mm. And surely one of the lessons from this pandemic is that that trend needs to be reversed. Yeah. But again, it's going to take more money, isn't it? That's the problem. Mm -hmm. Very, very difficult decisions for government. And obviously, we know that the uh, lockdowns have immense economic and social uh, impacts, negative impacts. So, you know, the government's made this decision. The vaccines are no doubt helping. Uh, milder variant, you know, uh, 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 into the mix as well. But, you know, we'd still, the, the, the fundamental about the NHS is still the same as it was two years ago, that, you know, the NHS has to be protected simply because if you fill up all those beds with people with COVID, then, you know, if you're pulled out of a car crash or you need a, a serious operation, um, you're seriously ill, you need a bed to go to. And that's what we were trying to do, what the government was trying to do, was protect the NHS fundamentally, primarily. More of your calls in just a moment. It's coming up to 8.45. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Despite a clear breach of a manifesto promise, the government has gone ahead and that national insurance hike becomes real. Health Secretary Sajid Javid, what happened to the £350 million a week that we benefit for the NHS from Brexit? The extra funding that was promised to the NHS before the pandemic hit, that's still happening. What we're talking about today is an additional £39 billion with every penny from the new levy going towards that. And that's on top of the three hundred and fifty million we get from leaving That's the EU. right. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player. LBC.
Last Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 8.47, if you just tuned in, Naomi Smith, Angus Walker, uh, Vernon Bogdanor and Hashi Mohammed on our panel tonight. Let's go to our next question. It's from Chris in Croydon. Chris, hello, what would you like to ask? Oh, good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. My question is this. Um, does the EU's attitude since Brexit show how right we were to leave? In particular, what are you thinking of? Um, Northern Ireland Protocol, France is um, shoveling refugees over the channel to, to us, and just to mention two. OK. Fernan? I was myself a Remainer, but that's yesterday's argument. We have left the European Union, and I am, like I think the questioner, appalled by the way we are being treated in relation to Northern Ireland in terms of the protocol, which imposes a regulatory and customs border across the Irish Sea. Which we agreed to. In effect, divides the United Kingdom. Yes, we agreed to it. It was the only way, I think, to avoid no deal. We should not have agreed to it, in my view. And I think it is not sustainable. And I don't think any other EU country would accept a customs border. If you ask the French to have a customs border dividing Alsace-Lorraine from the rest of France, or Germany, a customs border to divide Bavaria from the rest of the country. Bavaria would quite like that. <laughs> you'd, but you'd, I think you'd get a pretty sharp answer. Back to the Solvay. <laughs> you'd, you'd get a pretty sharp answer. And the EU seems to be saying to us that the price of leaving the EU is to lose Northern Ireland. Mm. Which they said in terms, didn't they, during the whole discussions. Um, now, what was that? The Beast of Berlimon. What was this? Martin Selmayr. That yeah. came from him, didn't it? Yeah, Ashi. Yeah, yeah. Well, I... I my view about this is quite simple. I really don't think that they pay attention to us as much as we're paying attention to them about why they're treating us this way and why they're doing this to us. I really do think that they are just looking out for their own interests. We're not part of that block. We've, we need to get over it and we need to think about what's in our interests. And if some of that aligns with theirs, great. And where it doesn't, we need to find a solution. I agree with you that the protocol <clears throat> is not in favour of our interests. But as you said, we've signed up to it. We need to get on with it. So for me, when we keep coming back to about how we're being treated and so on and so forth, I really do think that they do not care in the least. And they're just trying to think, OK, who's in the block? And how do we make sure they never leave? And part of that analysis involves we need to make sure that the Brits understand the cost of leaving. And that's the cold reality of and politics. And that's certainly Macron's position. That's Macron's position. That's the Germans' indirect position. I think that the smaller countries, there's a message that's being sent out. And that's the reality of where okay. we are. Um, Naomi, you mentioned trade earlier on. Mm. I mean, if you look at the fact that German exports to this country, I think, are down by 29%. Now, I must admit, I always thought that it would be German business that would uh, make sure that um, that sort of thing did not happen. OK, you've got the pandemic and everything, but 29%, mm. that's a pretty big drop um what what i mean going back to the question mm. do, do you think that, that this is all being politically led so the eu's attitude towards us is the same as it is towards other non-member states uh, we you know it, it is it's a rules-based organization it's how it treats people with whom it has to do trade but who aren't part of their single market and customs union it's worth remembering that the majority of people in northern ireland support the northern ireland protocol uh, best for britain led a delegation of the uk trade and business commission there uh, last month to speak to businesses about the problems that they were facing with it. We've written to both Sefcovic and Trust with recommendations for things that they could do without having to renegotiate everything that would just solve so much of the friction that is happening at the moment. But to answer the question, does the EU's attitude show we were right to leave? No. That attitude is, as I said, you know, the same as they, 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 they treat all other third-party countries. Nothing but the caller thinks they're <laughs> yeah. punishing us. Yes. And Hashi thinks but, they're punishing but, but, us. But whether we're right to leave or not comes down to whether or not we're having any benefits. And I would judge that as net benefits. So while there may be things that we can do now that we couldn't do before, the economic reality of it, as 
you've alluded to, is that uh, UK goods exports to the EU are down 18% on 2019, imports from the EU down 80% on 2019, and trade as a share of GDP has fallen 12% on 2019, twice uh, as much as uh, any other G7 country. And to, to put it into sort of terms that people can relate to and understand, we took evidence last week from somebody that manufactures school shoes in the UK, and they've said that Brexit red tape caused by the deal that this government negotiated has put £10 on the average price of school shoes. Now, listeners with children will know how incredibly expensive school shoes are anyway, and in a cost-of-living crisis, to have extra Brexit-induced red tape costs on top of that is really going to hurt the, the poorest first okay. and worst, and I think means that there isn't a, a, a net benefit from leaving the EU at all. Angus? Well, I, I think that uh, many people will uh, form the opinion that... Um, you know, the EU won't have much uh, sympathy for any pain being felt by a member that's left. And they are a rules-based organisation. They are a very rules-based organisation. And they are quite ruthless about protecting the single market because it is the jewel in their crown. It is the USP. It's the thing that attracts China to Created this Created by Britain. Market. Yeah, and, and yeah. you know, they, they, they will protect that at all costs. So if it's causing pain to a mem an ex-member who doesn't like the deal, well, they, they all, you know, certainly Macron will, will think, well, tough. And actually, probably, the suspicion will be uh, in many quarters that he quite enjoys um, Britain feeling that and, pain. And, and to be fair, France wasn't particularly reticent about doing this sort of thing, even when we were members, was it? <laughs> <laughs> to be frank. Right, let's um, go to the next question. Chris, thank you very much for that. Michael is in Ellesmere. Hello, Michael. Hi, um, very quickly. Should we cut our ties and dependency with China in the light of their human rights abuses and their broad support for Russia? Um, Hashi? I think cutting our ties with China is like trying to come off crack cocaine with some alcohol induced and lots and lots of partying for the last 20 years. It what is... was that like? <laughs> <laughs> We're still at it. Um, and I don't remember much of it. I think it's going to be hugely difficult. China is the global manufacturer of pretty much everything that we know at a cheap rate for the longest time. And so I completely agree the appalling human rights abuses of the Uyghur people and the propaganda around Ukraine and all sorts of other issues that I think it would be, in, our, in an ideal world, it would be amazing if we could try and find a way of putting pressure on, on China. But I really do think that it's much easier said than done. Naomi? Being outside the single market means that we don't have the bargaining power that we did when we were part of a, a collective of 600 million consumers. Well, we're still so when the sixth, we're, sixth largest economy in the world. That, that confers but, some bargaining power, doesn't it? But, but nowhere near on the scale. So when we're going out into the world and trying to forge new trade agreements uh, with you know uh, uh, other countries, uh, we will presumably try to sort of say, well, you know, we want some environmental clauses in here and, and human rights comfort and all the rest of it, but we just don't have the bargaining power. We are much smaller than China uh, economically and, of course, in terms of our um, our population. And so we've already seen ministers, for instance, row back on some of our environmental standards in securing that deal. So we are in this difficult position now where we are having to go out and forge new trade agreements, but unfortunately that does mean that, it, you know, we're going to be doing uh, deals with despots and and, and other sorts of uh, countries where we, we have questions over their uh, human rights abuses. And, you know... Uh, well, we haven't that, done so a, far, have we? Uh, well, well have I we? mean, we went cap in hand to Saudi Arabia a couple of weeks ago asking them to pump out a bit more oil, so uh, to no effect. Um, so it sort of sets the tone for, 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 you know, and obviously we had ministers in India last week. India, similarly, with not a great uh, record on human rights and has been, uh, you know, pretty neutral on the issue of Russia, to say, you know, at best. Well, that is, uh, you're absolutely right on that. But I mean, we can't not do business with India, the world's largest no, democracy. No, and, and of course, and, and what I'm saying is that we would have far more power and clout to get concessions out of them, to stick to the values uh, and the British values that, that we all uphold of, you know, f democracy and human rights uh, if we were part of a bigger bloc, but sadly we're not. OK, um, Vernon. Well, we do trade with a number of countries which have abuses of human rights, as Naomi says, but I don't think any of them in the, are in the same class, really, as China, which I think outclasses even Russia in human rights abuses, particularly, as, as she said, in, in the case of the 
Muslims who are in concentration camps. And I, I think the universities in particular need to look at their ties with China and whether they are worth preserving because obviously Chinese students who come here uh, can say what they like. British students who go to China cannot say what they like. And I, I think there is a strong case for universities to look very carefully at those ties. Mm. I spent uh, I, well, I spent three years as China correspondent living in Beijing and I documented and reported on many, many human rights abuses and I saw it with my own eyes, travelled around the country, but I also was there in Beijing when British ministers would come and visit and go and see their Chinese counterparts and raise human rights issues and they would get pretty short um, thrift, you know, they they would be um, even when we were members of the EU and the single market and all that, they wouldn't, They, you know. What was your judgment on whether they actually did that? Because it's very easy to say, well, of course I raised human rights, mm. but was was it, a, well, did, did they genuinely do that in a meaningful way? Well, they did. I mean, I know from speaking to um, diplomatic sources at the time that uh, of one minister who was shouted at by his Chinese counterpart when he raised human rights. So, you know, that was the sort of reception they were getting. And the Chinese would, would look, you know, just ignore them. And also the Chinese would come back and say, oh, you want to talk about human rights? Well, let's, at the time, let's talk about Guantanamo. Let's talk about Abu Ghraib. Um, let's talk about your shining beacons of um, freedom and democracy, mm. shall we? So I think that the Chinese are in a really strong position, impossible to cut off our ties. Decades ago, we made a deal. We subcontracted our manufacturing to China with all the, you know, to, to get all that sort of dirty manufacturing done by them. Uh, as a result, they, I mean, when I left uh, China, I think they had $37 trillion in foreign reserves. And they're everywhere. And think of how trillion. much... Yeah, Trillion. and think of how much they own of of Britain. Think of the companies yeah. they they own sh uh, shares in the Docklands. But we developments. but we don't actually have to do any more of that, do we? I mean, the, last week, Kwasi Kwarteng gave approval for China to buy a chip company in Wales. I think. Uh, why would you do that when? Um, when we have all of this going on, it's bizarre to me. Yeah, it's just one of the. I think it's a you know it's it's a really difficult one because it's a moral. There's a moral argument, and then you've got the fact that in business, it's cold-hearted decisions are being made, and you can't disentangle yourself that easily from these trade ties that are long-standing and go very deep. And and how much do you interfere in private business in those deals, etc.? Uh, that chip you know, company in Wales probably needs that one more than anything else. Right. Let's have our final text question from Victoria in Penzance. This is really going to test you all. Uh, research out today suggests Britain's favourite crisps are Walker's cheese and onion. What are your favourites? Vernon, are you a crisp eater? Um, I am, but I can't remember the brand of crisp <laughs> that I normally eat, which is probably a serious weakness for an academic. Um, but So I have what, to pass on. What, fla what flavour? Oh, uh, straightforward. I don't want any flavours in my crisps. Oh, right. Oh, wow. straightforward crisps. Has she? Oh. Well, I usually like the Walker's salt and vinegar, but I prefer the kettle lightly salted, and if I'm really in the mood, Doritos hot and spicy. <laughs> Naomi? You cannot beat a salt vinegar hula hoop. Yes. Actually, I, I, that, cheese and onion are quite good. Best. Angus? I think the Irish beaters, the tatoes, oh. cheese and onion, they are And their fantastic. spring onion. Their spring onion's really good too. Brannigan's ham and pickle, but they've stopped making them, <laughs> so I'm absolutely bereft, I'm afraid. Listen, thank you very much indeed. It's been a great show. Naomi, Naomi Smith, Angus Walker, Vernon Bogdanor and Hashi Mahamba will have you all back very, very soon. Coming up in a moment, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. What happened the last time you phoned the police? It's nine o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock. People living in eastern parts of Ukraine are being urged to get out while they have the chance. The Deputy Prime Minister has issued a warning as Russia is expected to refocus its efforts on the Donbass region. Eleven humanitarian corridors have been put in place to help civilians escape.